In April of 2017, Bertha, the massive tunnel boring machine, successfully completed digging a nearly two-mile deep bore tunnel under Seattle. The tunnel will carry traffic from the Alaskan Way viaduct, which had been damaged and deemed seismically unsafe after an earthquake. The tunnel will be much less intrusive than the wall-like viaduct, which cuts Seattle off from its waterfront. The tunnel, New Surface Street, and transit will take care of the viaduct's 110,000 vehicles per day. Why did Seattle move its highway from above ground to below ground? What were the other options they considered? What was that process like? To find out, we need to go back to the beginning of the story, in 2001. It was at the beginning of 2001 that the Washington State Department of Transportation began investigating how well the viaduct would stand up to an earthquake, or not. The viaduct was opened in 1953 and showing its age. In the middle of that investigation, on February 28th, the 6.8 magnitude Nisqually earthquake struck the southern end of the Puget Sound and damaged the viaduct's structure. They repaired and reopened the viaduct, but it was clear the viaduct needed to be replaced. So we've arrived at a decision point for our key stakeholders, the State Department of Transportation, the City of Seattle, and the Federal Highway Administration. All the technical experts agree that something needs to be done about the viaduct. But what are the options? Developing options, called alternatives or scenarios in planning jargon, is a common technique planners use to make long-term decisions. Planners develop several plausible alternatives and provide decision makers with enough information on those alternatives to make an informed decision. What alternatives did state transportation planners devise? They actually began the process in 2001 and came up with 76 replacement concepts by 2002. They whittled those down to three basic ideas in 2003. Above ground, rebuild the viaduct. Below ground, build a tunnel. And at grade, put the highway at street level. The rebuild option was never going to be popular, as many saw this process as an opportunity to get rid of an eyesore. The idea for a tunnel was similar to another famous mega project, the Big Dig in Boston. Just like in Boston, the idea for Seattle was to cut a cut and cover tunnel, meaning the tunnel would be right underneath the surface of Alaskan Way. It would be expensive and potentially disrupt the activities of nearby businesses, but it would remove the viaduct eyesore and allow for a redesigned, pedestrian-friendly Alaskan Way. The surface street idea drew inspiration from the Embarcadero in San Francisco. In 1989, an earthquake severely damaged the Embarcadero Freeway, which could win a viaduct lookalike contest. San Francisco leaders chose to demolish the freeway and replace it with an attractive boulevard. The results have been successful and removal has helped revitalize the waterfront. Traffic problems did not appear. So which option did the mayor of Seattle and other decision makers choose? They chose the tunnel with an elevated highway as a backup plan. They felt the tunnel provided highway capacity while still reconnecting Seattle with its waterfront. Decision made. Done deal, right? Well, not exactly. Seattle has something the locals call the Seattle process, where city leaders take forever discussing, debating, and studying something before making a final decision. So even though the mayor of Seattle chose a tunnel, the decision-making process wasn't over. In 2005, two new alternatives were developed and studied based on agency and public input. This time, the options were to rebuild an elevated viaduct or build a cut-and-cover tunnel. The state legislature then passed a law that required an expert panel to conduct a review of the plan. The expert panel concluded that the biggest risk to this entire process was indecision and vacillation by political and civic leaders. Sounds like the Seattle process at work. To further prove that Seattle's committed to the Seattle process, in 2007 the governor read the report of the expert panel and decided to put the alternatives on the ballot for an advisory vote of the public. The public could choose a replacement viaduct or a cut and cover tunnel. The public could vote yes or no on each alternative. The public voted no to both. During the run-up to the vote, Local advocates felt that a surface alternative should have been included and should be the ultimate direction of the project. They wanted something like the Embarcadero, but in Seattle. The result forced the governor, mayor, and county executive to come up with another set of alternatives, though they followed the same themes as before. They listened to the public opinion and three of the alternatives were surface boulevards. They included two elevated alternatives and three subterranean options, a cut and cover tunnel, a lidded trench, and a bored tunnel. In the end, the governor, mayor, and county executive recommended a hybrid approach that included a nice boulevard above ground and a deep bore tunnel below ground. The tunnel would not have exits downtown and serve as a bypass only. Why did they choose a deep bore tunnel, something they hadn't even considered before? The bored tunnel alternative would be more expensive than the cut and cover option, but be significantly less disruptive to area businesses while under construction. The tunnel boring machine would do its work well underneath downtown. The tunnel would meet the mobility goals of the project and reconnect Seattle with its waterfront. Alaskan Way would be remodeled to be a nice urban boulevard, something that decision makers hoped would appease the activists that campaigned against tunnels back in 2007. In April 2009, the state legislature passed a bill that committed them to paying $2.8 billion towards the cost of the tunnel alternative, with the rest of the money coming from other sources. 
there was significant outcry from the public that they didn't get a chance to vote on it like they did back in 2007, but it didn't stop the project this time. Perhaps there should have been more scrutiny, because for all the benefits associated with the selected alternative, there were some very real risks. Deep bore tunnels are a significant engineering challenge, particularly when you have a wide variety of soil types. In Seattle, the tunnel boring machine had to go through a soil type with large boulders and another that was compared to the consistency of a milkshake. Bertha, the name given to the tunnel boring machine by school children, was five stories tall and an incredibly complicated machine that not only dug tunnels, but also built the walls of the tunnel behind it. The project had a single point of failure. If something were to go wrong with Bertha, it would delay the entire project and drive up costs. And, in fact, something did go wrong. Bertha fell behind schedule after about three weeks. And in 2013, Bertha broke down. A tunnel from the surface had to be dug down to Bertha to assess and fix the problem. The stoppage lasted two years and added over $200 million to the project. Elected officials didn't seem to mind. Senate Transportation Committee Chairman Curtis King said that it could have been a lot worse. He was referring to how other mega projects exceeded their budgets by an average of 28%. This project is only 7% over budget so far. While that is some comfort, it is somewhat strange that decision makers would have chosen an alternative that on average goes wildly over budget. Back above ground, citizens are unhappy with the plans for Alaskan Way itself. Despite four lanes of traffic below ground, this new street would have four lanes of traffic above ground, plus two turn lanes and two transit lanes. The street may not be crossable all at once for a pedestrian. Local activists, the same who hoped for an attractive boulevard in 2007, are attempting to get the street redesigned, though local officials say the design is final. The reason for that wide street is a great illustration of why mega projects are so complicated and difficult to plan. The Port of Seattle would only contribute $300 million to the project if Alaskan Way included two general traffic lanes in each direction. They wanted to ensure that there would be capacity for trucks going to and from the nearby port. The transit agency wanted the bus lanes to serve former viaduct passengers. The tunnel doesn't have exits to downtown, so the buses need to be on the new street in dedicated lanes. Finally, the state ferry system needed those two turn lanes to serve all of the car ferry passenger traffic. There is even a parking and loading lane to satisfy businesses along the street. There are so many constituencies and needs, it's easy for a series of small requests to inflate a project into a mega project. You almost can't blame decision makers for choosing technically challenging and expensive solutions to these problems. It may be easier than dealing with the politics of saying no to one agency or another. The entire project should wrap up in 2020, nearly 20 years after the 2001 earthquake. Even with all that time, this replacement is still far from perfect. The project and process highlight some of the challenges inherent with city planning, including evaluating risk, navigating the political landscape, and incorporating public opinion. Hey, thanks for watching. If you stuck around this long, why not watch another video on city infrastructure, the story of Fresno's pedestrian mall? And if you want to be notified when I post a new video, consider subscribing.